These two paintings, both called sunflowers, are generally accepted as the finest of several depictions of the thick-stemmed, nodding blooms that Van Gogh made in 1888 and 1889 during his time in Arles. The first is now in the collection of the National Gallery in London, and the second is in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Van Gogh referred to this work as a repetition of the London painting, but art historians and curators have long been curious to know how different this repetition is from the first. Should it be considered a copy, an independent artwork, or something in between? An extensive research project conducted over the past three years by conservation experts at both the National Gallery and the Van Gogh Museum has concluded that the second painting was not intended as an exact copy of the original example, said Ella Hendricks, a professor of conservation and restoration at the University of Amsterdam, who was the lead researcher on the project. There are some 250 million cars in America, 250 million cars in the country with just over 300 million people, and most of those vehicles, of course, are gas-powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of all and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there is good news, according to our guests today, and that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek. Fast automobiles that don't use gasoline? These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels and digital technology, and they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads? Our guests today will help answer that. Obviously, this is all relevant to your final assignment, so we're going to talk about it. So until today, we've gone through face-to-face -face interviews as the main sort of part of interviewing the window. Today we're going to have a look at going to use an email and why they work, why they don't necessarily work, and what are the challenges and some of the things that we need to be understanding, you know when we are completing such interpreters. So let's start with the four and one. Obviously, there are a few benefits to them and they are listed there upon that slide. It's obviously less stressful for those of you who might be a little bit anxious about interviewing. Dogs aren't just man's best friend. Previous studies have shown that kids with dogs are less likely to develop asthma. Now a new study may show how. If results from my supply to us, the work was presented at a meeting of the American Society for Microbiology. The study tests what's called the hygiene hypothesis. The idea is that extreme cleanliness may actually promote disease later on. Researchers collected dust from homes that had a dog. They fed that house dust to mice. They then infected the mice with a common childhood infection called respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. We've decided to adopt, just as a loose theme for the course, a biological theme so that you can see the connections between chemistry and biology and the things you might consider doing in the future. We want you to think about the molecules that are relevant to your body, the processes that occur in your body, the chemistry that's going on and how energy plays a role. And we've divided the course into four sections and after each section there will be a midterm. The first one is about matter.
One seminal difference in policy remains. The coalition has not matched what is Labour's most important innovation promise, that is to bring together responsibilities for innovation, industry, science, and research. Under one single federal minister, innovation responsibilities currently lie within the powerful Department of Education and Science, and while there is a separate industry department, it has little influence within cabinet. This has hampered policy development and given Australia's innovation policies a distinct science and research bias. It is the scientists rather than the engineers who call the tune an innovation policy in Canberra. So it's no surprise our policies are all about boosting government-funded research and later commercializing the results. I'm going to argue that the tremendous increases in productivity that we associate with the Industrial Revolution originate not so much from changes in science or technology or new inventions, where England was far from unique as from changes in attitudes, attitudes towards morality, towards what constituted the good, attitudes towards property which became in England individuals long before it did on the continent. Attitudes toward the proper role of government. And together, these attitudes constitute much of what the Luddites were protesting against. We are trying to understand the locomotion of one of our closest living relatives, which is the Orangutan. And also the locomotion of all of the apes and the common ancestor of humans and the other apes. And in that area, we have had a big problem traditionally, and that we know a lot about how they move around the forest. I've been out to the forest and spent a year recording the different types of locomotion they use. But we have no idea about the energetic cost of how they move around the forest and the solutions that they find to problems of moving around the canopy. And what we're doing here is using the park or athletes as an analogy for a large-bodied ape moving around a complex environment. And getting them to move around in the course that we've made that they've never seen before. And we're going to record their energetic expenditure while they're doing it. Lead-in time is the amount of time that elapses between a business placing an order with a supplier for more stock or raw materials, and the delivery of the goods to the business. Businesses want the lead-in time to be as short as possible, so that they can meet their customer orders and minimize the time between paying for the stock and receiving the revenue from the customer. However, this may not happen due to a number of factors, such as delays in the supplier receiving the order or the breakdown of the supplier's lorries delivering the stock to the business. For a long time now, it's been a widely accepted and rarely questioned belief that a strong corporate culture goes hand in hand with success. However, a recent study has cast some doubt on this principle. After all, the authors of the report argue for culture. A company builds up may be strong, but wrong. There is little point in every employee marching to the same tune if they are all marching in the wrong direction.
Also, malaria is something that is a very complex disease with this complex life cycle. That means that if you're going to eliminate it, you have to be able to target cute parasites and humans. You have to be able to target parasites in the mosquitoes, that mosquito population. And so that requires a lot of resources. It requires really good planning and a health system across all these different levels. And so I think the political capital that you need for that, the educational infrastructure you need for that, the economic resources you need for that are quite a challenge. Belief is the human capacity to imagine, to be creative, to hope and dream, to infuse the world with meanings, and to cast our aspirations far and wide. Limited neither by personal experience nor material reality. Believing is a commitment, an investment, a devotion to possibilities. Beliefs permeate neurobiologies, bodies and ecologies acting as dynamic agents in evolutionary processes. The human capacity for belief, the specifics of belief, and I, and our diverse belief systems shape, structure and alter our daily lives, our societies, and the world around us. In this tutorial, we will show you how to find specific journal articles using the library catalog. The university subscribes to over 18,000 journals across a variety of subjects, most of which are available electronically to find a specific journal article using a library catalog. We need to search by the journal name as individual article titles are not listed in the catalog. Green chemistry is a, is a concept designed to develop technologies which allow chemistry to be practiced with minimal damage to the environment or in an environmentally compatible way. And it's meant to cover both chemical processes and chemical products. The center, if you would, set up about seven or eight years ago, and the idea was to provide a hub of activities that covered fundamental research work, industrial collaboration, but also educational developments. So we work with schools and on public projects as well, and also networking. So we network out to well over 1,000 people around the globe. The thing that makes it difficult is because even if life had evolved on Mars, the chances of being preserved are very small. If we use Earth as a reference and our planet is teeming with life, yet it rarely preserves evidence of life of the fossil record. And the focus now is on exploring for habitable environments. If you're looking for water, a source of energy, either solar energy or thermal energy or chemical energy, and then organic carbon, assuming life as we know it on Earth based on carbon. So those are sort of the three things that we're looking for in the course of our mission. Some ecotourism offers visitors close encounters with different species, but new research suggests that these activities may not be so great for the animals. Researchers tagged stingrays in Stingray City in the Cayman Islands to monitor their movements and behavior. Compared to stingrays outside of the tourism area, those in Stingray City switched their activity patterns from night to day when tourists handed out food and mated year-round instead of seasonally. 
The stingrays also had more bite marks, which suggests increased aggression towards one another. The study is in the journal PLOS One. Past research has found increased stress and more intra- and interspecies aggression among animals that have been fed by humans. Interactive tourism is a growing business, but researchers say that more study is needed to ensure the health and safety of humans and animals alike. Ecotourism may be good for a given species, as humans become engaged in its survival, but for the individual members of that species tasked with dealing with people, it may not be a walk in the park. Now, millions of roses get handed out on Valentine's Day, but growing roses has an environmental impact worse than many other crops. Start with climate change. Most roses in the U.S. and Europe are imported from warmer climes. All that flying and trucking adds thousands of metric tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Then there's all the water needed to well water the flowers, and the runoff fouled by copious quantities of pesticides needed to make the roses look perfect. There's also the wildlife and workers poisoned by all that fumigation. Add to that habitat destruction, where floral plantations displace native forest and wetlands. Finally, there's the refrigeration needed to keep those blooms fresh. The electricity is often produced by burning fossil fuels, and the refrigerant gases also exacerbate climate change. A more sustainable and possibly more romantic approach is to go with flowers certified by outfits like Veriflora, or even better, whatever flowers are in season locally. Of course, that's not much help for those of us in wintry climes. Maybe try writing a poem. Let's see. Roses are red, violets are blue. <laughs> We have ignition. We have liftoff. Let's say you've saved up 200 grand for a trip to space with Virgin Galactic. Lucky you. But are you healthy enough to fly? You'll have to talk with your doctor. A new study in the BMJ outlines the role that general practitioners will have to play in commercial spaceflight. After all, astronauts typically have to be in tip-top shape. But opening the door to the paying public means that less healthy individuals will soon have access to space too. And the stress of spaceflight, combined with the negative effects of weightlessness on muscle and bone, could cause real problems. It may be up to your personal physician to make the go no go call based on your medical history. Among the potential hypotheticals floated in the BMJ study, can my patient with stable angina and a pacemaker for complete heart block participate in a suborbital Virgin Galactic flight? What is the maximum allowable time that my patient with osteoporosis can spend on a planned vacation at a space hotel? There are no official answers yet. But the study's authors note that such questions may be in the air, or lack thereof, in the not too distant future. Ladybugs love to snack on aphids and other pests, so people began importing an Asian species called the harlequin ladybird as natural pest control. But in their new environments, the harlequins wiped out native ladybugs, and they have their parasites to thank. That's according to research in the journal Science. A parasite called Microsporidia lies dormant in the circulatory systems of harlequin ladybirds. But when scientists injected Microsporidia into a common European ladybug species, the insects died within two weeks. When the ladybugs were injected with dead microsporidia or a control substance, most survived. Harlequin ladybird's immune systems, on the other hand, have learned to deal with microsporidia, which lets the insects use them as biological weapons. Because one way ladybugs compete is by consuming the eggs and larvae of rival species. When European ladybug species eat the harlequin ladybird eggs and larvae, they also consume the microsporidia and die. The discovery demonstrates an important role of immunity in evolutionary selection, and it shows that there are many ways to lose a food fight.